Okay, thank, thank you. So I will just give a brief introduction to our company first. Easy Search Medical was founded in November 2011 and specializes in the development and commercialization of high-end minimally invasive products targeting diseases associated with general, bariatric, thoracic, and colorectal procedures. Easy Search Medical is committed to providing comprehensive and integrated solutions to the global market. Every day, more than 500 employees' efforts are focused on the mission of providing minimum and affordable MIS products to hospitals, surgeons, and their patients. This commitment is rooted in the development of best-in-class devices that are rooted in strong clinical and health economic evidence that supports the entire pa patient care continuum. In this way, Easy Search Medical is dedicated to establishing our reputation as an innovative, market leading betting class device manufacturer. In 10 years, we intend to take a leadership role as a provider of MIS surgery devices in China and to become a competitive player by exerting significant influence on the global market. We'd like to introduce you a little bit about, about our webinar series as well. Easy Search has been dedicated to overall excellence of clinical performance through both theoretical and empirical contributions. And we hope we could jointly promote the improvement of scientific research and medical standards in the field of international obesity and bariatric surgery through our webinars. For this particular webinar, we are very honored to be able to invite the following experts who have achieved excellence in the bariatric field to be our moderator and speakers. Our dear moderator, Dr. Alan Sabin from USA, and our dear speakers, Dr. Rodolfo Oviedo from USA, Dr. Jan Chagas from Czech, and Dr. Christian Rodriguez from Mexico. We'd like to express our thankfulness to all of our invited guests, and we wish you an enjoyable and intriguing journey. So I'd give the head to our dear doc, uh, doctor, moderator, Dr. Alan Saber. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy, and thank you for having me moderating this uh, session. As we know, this is a, a easy surgery medical sponsor uh, uh, webinar, bariatric webinar. Uh, uh, my name is Alan Saber. I'm from New Jersey. Uh, the title of our uh, webinar today is a comparison of uh, treatment effectiveness uh, of a different uh, single anastomosis uh, bariatric procedure. Uh, as you know, we have, there is a more and more interest uh, towards a uh, uh, simple bariatric procedure and uh, uh, having uh, one anastomosis uh, gastric bypass or one anastomosis uh, uh, duodena switch uh, SADI um, will uh, simplify the procedure. Uh, so they uh, uh, webinars, we have uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, speakers, experts in the field. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. So the first speaker is Dr. Rodolfo Ovido, uh, Dr. Odalvo is a director of robotic general surgery, associate professor of clinical surgery, Houston Methodist. Dr. Odalvo will, uh, uh, will talk to us about robotic SADI as technical aspects and the personal lessons learned. Dr. Odalvo. Thank you, Dr. Saber. It's an honor to be introduced by you. And thank you, Tracy, for the kind introduction as well. I'm going to share my screen. And please confirm if you can see my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Yep. Excellent. Thank yep. you. So my title exactly is Robotic CDS Technical Aspects and Personal Lessons Learned. And uh, this is a product of my journey in the metabolic and bariatric surgery arena uh, for the last uh, seven years at least. Uh, and that includes robotic surgery. Of course, these are my disclosures. Of course, I'm a consultant for Easy Search Medical, and I'm very proud of that. Thank you, Easy Search, for the kind invitation. So from the annals of bariatric history, I'm a big fan of uh, history. And it's really interesting how everything started in Spain. And now how the duodenal switch, the single anastomosis one, began in Spain as well. It's really an interesting parallel I can draw. Uh, many of you may know that the first documented bariatric patient, at least in writing, was King Sancho I of Leon, Spain who was uh, uh, severely obese. And he had to go to a physician named Hasdai Ibn Shraput in Cordoba, Spain, who closed his lips so that he would not be able to eat anything solid. And he was in a liquid diet for a long time. 
he actually lost his throne for a while and then he regained his throne. Uh, he, he reclaimed it when he was able to lose weight. He was more confident, more commanding. Um, you can see a summary of all the typical bariatric procedures that started in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, I ask you to pay attention to the one in red in the middle, the biliopancreatic diversion, uh, which was established in the 1980s by Dr. Scopinaro from Italy. And now, if you go all the way down to the bottom, of course, you have Dr. Gagné, who introduced, along with his colleagues, the sleeve gastrectomy laparoscopically as a standalone procedure, which was actually created as the first stage of a duodenal switch. But now you have Dr. Sanchez Pernaute, who established the technique for the laparoscopic single anastomosis duodenal switch back in 2007 from Spain. So that's just a little bit of history. When I was a resident, a chief resident, I was graduating, I remember, I, I didn't really know that I was going to do bariatric metabolic surgery at the time. I was attracted to it, to it because of my mentors and the, the beauty of the technique and how patients progressed. And, and the Stampede trial from the Cleveland Clinic faculty was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. As you can see, it was the uh, Stampede trial stands for surgical treatment and medications potentially eradicate diabetes efficiently. You all know, we all know about the trial, how they were able to randomize patients to three arms, one with only medical therapy for diabetes type two. Uh, patients had to have a hemoglobin A1C greater than 7.0. Uh, um, in addition, we had patients who had uh, randomization to the gastric bypass arm and all other patients who were randomized to the sleeve arm. And as you all know, surgical therapy is more effective than medical therapy alone. And the gastric bypass had superior results, even superior to those of the sleep. So this is a little anatomy uh, a diagram of the classic duodenal switch. And in order to talk about the single anastomosis switch, I think it's very important for all of us to revisit the anatomy of the classic biliopancreatic diversion with duodenal switch. As you can see, there is a sleeve. It typically doesn't have to be as, as narrow as the typical sleeves as a standalone excuse me, as a standalone procedure, there is an anastomosis at the duodenal bulb between the bulb and the distal ilium. There is a duodenal stump that is stay there, that stays there. There is a biliopancreatic limb that is quite long. And then there is an ileoileostomy, anastomosis downstream. And there is a common channel that is usually very short uh, with respect to that of the gastric bypass. So patients are able to lose a significant amount of weight. I'm going to show you my own personal data. In my, in my lessons learned. Uh, I would like to begin with the classic DS because in reality, in order to talk about the single anastomosis one, first let's, let's visit, um, let's, let's uh, establish the literature on this one, let's see the results and let's see what we can do to improve on it. So this is part of my work when I was in Virginia, uh, the state of Virginia on the Eastern side of the United States, I published our group's experience over four years of classic duodenal switches. This was presented at the American College of Surgeons in 2019 in San, in San Francisco. This was the paper that originated from that presentation. Uh, it was laparoscopic duodenal switch versus runway gastric bypass at a high volume community hospital, a retrospective cohort study from a rural setting. I say rural because it's in the middle of a rural area that serves about half a million patients in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. It was a beautiful hospital, large hospital, but it was a community hospital. And in the literature, there were very few studies published from that point of view. Most of them were in urban centers or big academic centers. And uh, these are some of my collaborators. And we were able to see that in our Winchester, Virginia experience, most of the patients and demographics had a higher BMI to begin with in terms of the duodenal switch compared to the gastric bypass with statistical significance they tended to be more significantly uh, uh, affected by diabetes. They had higher incidence of sleep apnea. And at the same time, the reflux, uh, uh, most of the reflux patients, gastric gastroesophageal reflux were um, belonged to the gastric bypass arm. We also had more patients with adhesions in the bypass group. The follow-up was much longer for the duodenal switch because the group had been doing, we had been doing duodenal switches for a long time. And uh, the primary outcomes were 30-day morbidity and mortality. And as you can see, there was significant statistical significance in terms of the uh, morbidity for the duodenal switch, 31% morbidity compared to 13% for the gastric bypass and mortality, no difference. Um, you can see here that the duodenal switch, the first column, it takes longer 
you can see that the EBL or estimated block loss is higher. You can also see that the, the, the post-stop or the BMI is lower in the duodenal switch. And you can see a greater decrease in BMI points. Uh, just to go through the data, the patients with the duodenal switch tended to have a higher incidence of superficial surgical site infections, but marginal ulcers were present more in the bypass group as expected. The post-op post abdominal wall hematoma was higher in the duodenal classic group. And this, the subsequent surgery, interestingly, the classic duodenal surgery, duodenal switch group had a higher incidence of post-operative surgery, many times for cholecystectomy. Now, this is the most important slide probably from the, from the paper. Uh, you, you can see maybe because of the fact that the, bi the bypass patients were not followed uh, for a longer time, um, that really no significant difference, at least in our series, between the duodenal switch patients and the bypass in terms of diabetes. Really interestingly, we were expecting to see more resolution of diabetes there, but higher incidence of hypertension resolution with the duodenal switch, higher incidence of GERD resolution with the bypass. But talking about this, I would like to show just a brief video of what a classic duodenal switch looks like laparoscopically. I'm going to fast forward in the interest of time. But it's important to see it so that you can see how much easier it is to do a single anastomosis one. This is a purely laparoscopic, no robotic technology here. We're making, we're using the retroduodenal transection technique. We're not mobilizing the stomach completely. It's just a retroduodenal tunnel. We're, we're using some instruments that semi-articulate. Um, and uh, we're very careful with the common bile duct, of course. And we make that tunnel and we're very careful not to injure the gastroduodenal artery underneath and over the head of the pancreas. And then we transect the duodenum at least at two centimeters to three centimeters beyond the duodenal, uh, beyond the beginning of the duodenum at the uh, um, uh, prepyloric vein of Mayo in that region. So we're going to go through and we're going to transect it. There we go. We use a laparoscopic stapler. At that, at that time, we were using reinforcement material, polymer material. And once you do that, then you turn your attention to counting from the ileocecal valve. At that point, we're making the sleeve the usual way. We just make the sleeve and go all the way to the left cruise of the diaphragm. It's really no change with respect to any sleeve gastrectomy that you have performed. But uh, turn your attention to the following. After we uh, create the sleeve, it doesn't have to be a, a tight sleeve at all. Uh, typically, people quote a 70% sleeve gastrectomy, and, and that's okay because most of the weight loss will come from the malabsorption component. Now we identify the ileocecal valve, and this is important. Nobody should talk at this time. Nobody should play any music. This is very important to count and not to twist the limb. Um, and we count all the way up to, at that point, we were making a 125 centimeter common channel. We mark it with clips and then we continue to count for 150 centimeters. And at that point, then we make the division of the ilium in order to bring up one of the limbs to anastomose to the duodenal bulb. And so here we go. We're dividing the ilium, maintaining the orientation. We're going to bring one of the limbs up to meet the duodenal bulb and make that anastomosis. Remember, this is just one anastomosis and we're gonna create it. We, at that point, we were using the staple technique. Uh, we stapled it, we put some stay sutures, just in the interest of time, I'm going to fast forward this. And it's a nice technique. We introduced the stapler and then after the linear stapler technique, then we close that in with the, with the uh, suture material. We, we use the intracorporeal suturing technique, free needle technique. We're using barbed absorbable suture and we do it into layers and that's the end of that anastomosis. But then we still have another anastomosis to worry about. And I'm going to fast forward to that. We still have the ileo ileostomy anastomosis. And yes, it's just one anastomosis, but it prolongs the time of the operation and it, it, leads, it may lead to complications such as internal herniation, et cetera. Uh, but we do it and then we close the internal hernia defects as much as we can to prevent internal herniation in the future. And then we do an endoscopic leak test. But I'm going to end this uh, just to show you about the San Antonio experience. When I was in San Antonio, I had a lot of experience doing single anastomosis duodenal switches. This is the classic diagram that you will see on, on, um, on the media. And you can see that it's a 300 centimeter efferent limb leading to the duodenal ileostomy anastomosis. Then you have the duodenal stump and then you have the bilio, the, it's no longer a biliopancreatic limb, it's really an afferent limb afferent limb carrying the enzymes for digestion, joining the duodenal ileostomy and then an efferent limb. Some people still call it a common channel. And then of course the sleep gastrectomy portion. 
My preferred approach nowadays is to do it robotically. It, it's still done. I can still do it laparoscopically when I don't have access to the robot, but it's very comfortable to do it robotically. Four ports, and that's all I do. Uh, this is the 12 millimeter uh, port. The rest of them are just eight millimeter ports. Occasionally, I will put a liver retractor, but most of the times I don't have to because I use a stay suture to elevate the liver. These are some of the basic instruments that I use, nothing really unusual. And definitely it can be done with the laparoscopic stapler, like the Easy Search stapler. Absolutely. It doesn't have to be a robotic stapler at all. And I teach my residents about using both uh, or, or laparoscopic versus robotic staplers so that they're prepared when they enter practice. So this is the main video I wanted to show. Here we go. So in order to do the, the SADI, it's very simple, very simple steps. You, I begin in this, in this one, I begin by counting from the ileocecal valve backwards. We're going to count all the way to 300 centimeters. Then we're going to fix that loop, maintaining the orientation. This will be A ferrant, this will be E ferrant. I just suture it to the greater momentum with loose stitches, with air knots, so that I don't have to look for it later. Now I'm using um, uh, the technique for the sleep gastrectomy creation. And then if you see I'm mobilizing the stomach towards the duodenum, this is different. This is not the technique for the duodenal, retroduodenal tunnel that I described before. This is actually mobilizing the greater curve uh, all the way down. And you stop when you see the gastroduodenal artery over the head of the pancreas. At the beginning, I was afraid that I would have ischemia of this area, but no, you don't, you don't see any incidence of ischemia. Sometimes you get venous congestion in that region. And what I do is I preserve the right gastric artery seen right here. So I try to preserve it so that you still, you still have blood supply to the prepyloric region. And this is the area where we're going to transect. You see the GVA and then you see the head of the pancreas. So I continue with the sleep the normal way, nothing changes there. At the time I was using a metal retractor, but nowadays I use a stitch. Then we transect. At that point, my, my ex-partner, my ex-colleague was using San Antonio, was using the laparoscopic stapler, and that's okay. A hybrid approach is absolutely valid. And then we create the sleeve, and then all you have to worry about at that point is making a single anastomosis duodenal ileostomy. And I'm gonna fast forward just for the interest of time, out of respect to the other speakers. Here we go. So I favor a hands-on anastomosis in two layers. It's a beautiful technique. It can be definitely done laparoscopically. It doesn't have to be done robotically, but I just find it more advantageous to use a robot when I can use it. Um, and it's done in two layers. You, you put a first layer to fix the two tissues together, duodenal bulb. And you can see how the advantage of this technique with respect to the retroduodenal tunnel is that in the retroduodenal tunnel technique, the duodenum hangs in that area. Here, it comes almost vertically to the midline. You can see a little bit of venous congestion here, but you'll notice that when we're doing the leak test, that congestion almost goes away as soon as this portion receives blood supply from the mesentery of the ileum. It's really an interesting phenomenon. We can use ICG fluorescence and you'll, you'll observe that phenomenon as well. And now it's just a two hand, a two layer hands-on anastomosis in both directions. It's very easy to do and replicate for most surgeons. And it's something that is, it's actually a pleasure to do. It's a lot of, uh, it's very relaxing to do, and it's very consistent and reproducible when I teach it to my residents and fellows. So I'm going to fast forward. You've all seen anastomosis done, uh, uh, if not robotic, via the open fashion. Nothing really changes. You're just doing the same thing you would normally do with the open approach. Finally, a leak test is important to clamp both the efferent and the afferent limb so that you can perform a reliable leak test, which is also a patency test. Um, just to conclude my, my brief segment, this is one of my favorite papers on the topic. Uh, this was by Dr. Sanchez Pernaute, uh, who introduced this technique in 2007, along with Dr. Antonio Torres from Spain. This was mainly a group from Spain, uh, from Madrid. And this was their experience with the single anastomosis duodenal ileal bypass. And you can see most patients at 45 months, 48 months, I mean, four years, they achieved almost 100% excess weight loss. That's just incredible. Uh, keep in mind, they were using a 250 centimeter efferent limb, 250. Nowadays, I use a 300 one. And this is another one of my favorite papers in, in SWORD. This was a multi-institutional uh, study, the uh, longitudinal study, and that includes Dr. Andre Teixeira, one of my colleagues from Orlando, multiple other surgeons. It was a group from the United States, from, uh, from uh, uh, Australia as well, and from Spain. And look at this, my favorite table to show. Look at this. When you compare the gastric bypass to the classic DS, to the SADI, look at the incidence of bovulus, look at the incidence of internal hernia, marginal ulcers almost unheard of, and then you look at bile reflux, very, very low. So 
is a really, really good procedure to do, very safe, very reproducible. And my final table to show you, when you compare the classic DS to the SATI, the difficulty level to me is intermediate. It's not really that difficult compared to the classic DS. And excess weight loss could be 70 to 80%. But as you know, uh, Antonio Torres and Sanchez Pernaute who quoted at, at four years, almost 100% excess weight loss. Um, it's a gastric sleeve and a loop duodenal ileostomy. It's not a ruin wide reconstruction. It's only one anastomosis. The sleeve is a little more relaxed, 70%. A very low risk of marginal <clears throat> ulcers, extremely low risk of internal hernias, very low risk of anastomotic leaks, and, and a, the ideal patient should be somebody with a BMI over 50 with diabetes, ideally, and it's a 300 centimeter efferent limb in my hands. So in conclusion, <clears throat> the SADI is effective. It's a metabolic operation that is ideal for patients with BMI over 50, ideally with diabetes, no significant reflux. The robotic technology enables surgeons to perform the operation with well-known ergonomic advantages, but it's not a requirement. It can be done laparoscopically, absolutely. And the hybrid approach when you use a robot is also interesting and it's feasible and it's helpful if a totally robotic approach is not possible or it's not preferred by the surgeon. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. This is uh, Texas Medical Center, Houston Methodist. I'm giving the presentation from my office right here. And I welcome any one of you who wants to visit Houston to contact me and I'll be happy to show you the Texas Medical Center and, and host you here. So thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ovidu, for a comprehensive uh, review and um, sharing uh, your experience. So every time we talk about uh, a robotic procedure combined to a laparoscopic procedure, we need to mention two things. We need to mention the cost as well as uh, OR time. So can you tell us, uh, given the fact that you try both, so you try laparoscopic uh, SADI as well as a robotic SADI, can you tell us uh, the difference in, in your expertise and experience between the OR time and the cost? Absolutely. Um, so in my experience, at the beginning, it was much longer to do it robotically. Absolutely. When I was beginning my technique, Nowadays, it actually takes me less time to do it robotically. And so intraoperative time is much less. Um, it takes me about 100, you know, I'm sorry, takes me about anywhere from 90 minutes to 100 probably, all skin to skin to do it robotically. Um, laparoscopically, maybe a little longer. Um, I would say the robotic technology, it's very few instruments. And I do. it takes me that long, of course, because I have to teach. Um, and I have the fellow, the resident doing the case. Instrumentation is very minimal. I try to use a laparoscopic stapler to bring the cost down. Um, I try everything I can to minimize the, 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 the cost, but you're right. I mean, laparoscopically, I can do it a little bit cheaper. Um, in terms of the time though, it's shorter when I do it robotically, especially when I'm doing it on my own with my first assistant. Uh, but I'm in an academic institution, Dr. Saver, so you know, you have to commit to the teaching of residents and fellows, so it takes a little longer. But in exchange, my institution firmly believes in robotics and, and the long-term benefit. And so at the end, we have proven, and we, have, we haven't published these data, but we have fewer readmissions, um, less blood loss, and more benefits when we do it with the robotic technology. I think it's just because of the ergonomic advantages and less tissue manipulation. But I'm a big fan and of And you think one response. of the reasons... Great. You think one of the reasons for difference in the OR time is you, you have different technique for duodenal dissection. I see with the laparoscopic, you do the tunnel technique to preserve the blood supply, but maybe you take you maybe a longer time because you have to make sure you don't injure the duodenum anterior, you don't injure the gastro duodenal artery or a common bad ductal surgery. Uh, but at the same time, you preserve the blood supply. But in the robotic uh, technique, you show that you have a, yeah, a, like a, a extensive dissection of the greater curvature and going down to the duodenum. You think this is one of the factors that affect the OR time, or it's because of with robotic, you have the same team in the OR time, so people not doing the same thing, and, you know, and have you have a short, you know, learning curve. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, sometimes I mix it actually to teach the residents or fellows the different techniques. I, I think it, it takes me about the same amount of time because even when you do it with the retro gastric dissection technique, not the tunnel, I, I'm still very careful with the GDA. I'm still very careful with preserving the right gastric. So I, I believe it takes me about the same amount of time, but that's an interesting point. Maybe, maybe it has to do with that as well. Great. And one, more, one other thing that I would like to notice 
uh, or uh, just uh, keep an attention to it is how the easy indolite the stapler of our company easy surgery medical it has a greater range of reticulation 120 degree as well as the anvil is thinner so i think it works very well it fit very well when you work through a narrow tunnel for example if you do a, a retrotidial dissection or in gastric bypass you creating the gastrohepatic uh, uh, tunnel so working in a, in a small tunnel give you precise uh, you know uh, articulation and the wide range of mobility as well as a small anvil that can fit in small uh, a small uh, uh, spaces and this is advantage of uh, easy surgical over the other uh, stables in the market great thank you very much uh, dr dr obido next speaker uh, will be uh, uh, dr uh, young Kejek uh, from uh, Czech, uh, Dr. Kejek is a senior consultant and the head of surgery, a licensed uh, member Czech uh, General Medical Society. He's a head of uh, surgery department, uh, uh, hospital therapeutic. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Young will talk to us about uh, gastric sleeve or bypass, uh, tips, tricks, uh, pitfall, and type of anastomosis. Uh, thank you very much uh, once more for the invitation. Uh, I'm really honored to be in such a great company because uh, my lecture is uh, just such a, a review of uh, current status in Czech Republic while we try to uh, be on top, of course, we uh, don't have uh, such big numbers as my um, predecessor uh, uh, was uh, telling us. So I will uh, share my presentation with you. So uh, just uh, for sure, uh, I work as a head of uh, general surgery department uh, in district hospital, as I said earlier. And uh, uh, what is bariatric surgery or the concern in Czech Republic, uh, it still has uh, stigma of uh, commercial surgery. Uh, there were um, in the past uh, quickly developing types of procedure uh, procedures uh, which are either abandoned or are deemed ineffective, like uh, gastric banding, gastric balloon, gastric plication, which is a specialty in Czech Republic invented by Professor Fried, but it's poorly restrictive and quite ineffective. Um, because of these uh, individual setbacks of each of these procedures, uh, the strategies were changing quickly and the patients were not too uh, confident about these uh, procedures, uh, including um, uh, our specializations like diabetologists and intrinsic medicine doctors. So uh, now, uh, after already mentioned stampeded trial, we are trying to convince the uh, specialized um, uh, so the other specialists that it really has sense. As you can see, the obesity is great uh, problem in a whole developed world and even in developing world. And uh, there uh, you will very difficult. Uh, or hardly find an organ system which is not affected by obesity. So uh, because of this, uh, many uh, new departments are starting with bariatric surgery. I think it's the problem even in your countries. And uh, they purely do sleeps, which are, um, which are quite effective, but are fast and... Uh, they don't think or they don't think about revisional procedures which uh, come in time and will uh, be more numerous so our experience uh, or my experience from my team we firstly started in a private hospital where we did really commercial uh, sleeves we did about 150 a year because it also was not purely bariatric uh, department and now we work in 
uh, state hospital or state uh, controlled hospital, which is uh, where we try to, uh, to perform complex bariatric surgery. We visited many workshops, but uh, so we try to be as up to date as possible. But because of our spectrum, we only are able to do now uh, sleeves, one anastomosis, gastric bypass, and true and why, which we started recently. But why we are doing we 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 not doing it just because of the cosmetic effect as we did in the private sector. We do it uh, for people or for patients who have metabolic syndrome. They um, have uh, diabetes. And as you can see here, this was our first OIGB. Uh, we started with this in October 20. Uh, this is patient who had diabetes on uh, insulin dependent type 2, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, asthma, and uh, she has lost uh, 35 kgs after one year. So it's about 85 uh, extensive body mass. She lost sleep apnea, diabetes. Now she is only on oral antidiabetics, normal level of lipidemia and no clinical uh, signs of asthma. Uh, this is uh, for sleeves, we did. These are like healthcare tourists. So I, I did not include them in my uh, like um, summary later because we in fact were not uh, able to do any um, follow-up visits. They just undertook the procedure and flew away. Uh, we we were not like confident with the system, so so it was one of the reasons why we left uh, this hospital. So we uh, our indications for these procedures are uh, if there are no main comorbidities, BMI has to be above forty, and if there are comorbidities, then it's thirty-five. Uh, there are some individual uh, like uh, exceptions possible even in age, which is 18 to 60. We uh, try to do the procedures uh, as we try to keep in mind revisional surgeries in the future. So there is always a discussion about cholecystectomy perioperatively if the patient has some or had uh, some uh, biliary colics and so on, we do it uh, in one procedure because uh, in case of cholecholitiasis, ERCP might be very difficult to perform or impossible. Um, we think or uh, still are not sure, but we try to do longer gastric pouch because uh, it's difficult uh, to expand in the future, but has more marginal ulcers. So it's even um, point for discussion. And uh, there is discussion about whether to use linear or circular stapler to do the gastro jejunostomy. Uh, in sleeves, we do anti rotation plasty, which is also uh, some something to discuss. And uh, in bypasses, we do anti reflux stitch and efferent lymph fixation. So I will show you later. So these are procedures you all know. Uh, I don't think we have to lose time on this. Uh, so uh, in case we uh, want to um, do some bariatric surgeries, we uh, discuss this uh, firstly with the uh, patient who comes to us. Uh, we need to check whether all the in, uh, indication criteria have been, have been fulfilled. And we need in Czech Republic to uh, do obesitology consultation uh, because to be reimbursed from insurance company, the patient has to uh, fail obesitological uh, leadership and uh, dispensarization for at least three months. And then it is possible to undertake bariatric surgery. Uh, we uh, prefer RUNY uh, above OIGB, and only if uh, both of these procedures are not possible, we do sleep. Uh, we have also implemented ERAS, which means uh, enhanced recovery after surgery, but um, 
we still need to have longer hospital stays, which needs our insurance company. I will, oh, we can discuss it later. So how we do it, we first check uh, whether there is or is not any pathology which would like make impossible to do the bypass, which means large liver adhesions uh, or some, some um, pathology to the small intestine. And if it seems so, then we switch from uh, the possibility of bypass to sleeve, and we may do it as two-stage procedure. All the patients, of course, have informed consent uh, in forward and are informed uh, that we do the procedure uh, as we see it, uh, how it looks like in the abdominal cavity. So uh, we do it in beach chair position with increased intra-abdominal working space. We try to perform the procedures in a relative hypotension, uh, which we want the, our anesthesiologists to have systolic blood pressure uh, below uh, 120 millimeters of mercury, because um, we think that it decreases the bleeding uh, from the stapling line. And uh, after the resectional phase, we uh, let the anesthesiologist to elevate blood pressure. So if there are any blood vessels from the resection or the staple line, we can put on the clips as is shown on this picture. And we check the anastomosis uh, with dye. We don't do it as, as um, Dr. Uh, Oviedo said, we don't do it endoscopically, we do it with uh, dye. So this is a common picture of um, sleeve gastrectomy. I have only short video for anastomotic check we'll later, but uh, I, I don't think I have to talk much about this. The only difference which we see uh, is that we do uh, anti-rotation plasty. We um, like fix back the skeletized omentum, as is uh, seen on the fourth picture, uh, and we believe it decreases the bleeding from the stapling line and also uh, leaves the um, leaves the stomach uh, to be uh, in one shape uh, to avoid twisting, which we uh, are quite afraid of in the future. Uh, so just as the patient stands, the omentum just uh, hangs down and makes the stomach more, uh, I would say, in one shape, in the banana shape. So this is uh, our record till now. It's a patient with BMI of 68 who was, um, because we want these errors, and we uh, let them stand the day of surgery and uh, he, uh, we need to uh, have them at, uh, in the hospital at least uh, till the end of the week. We, we have uh, surgeries on Tuesdays, so they leave on Fridays. And this is our technique for OAGB. Uh, we start here, or I will talk about this later, but we start the upper part uh, uh, by opening the lesser sac in the uh, small curvature, you can see it's quite long, the gastric pouch. And then we use a 45 millimeter stapler uh, and alongside uh, such a broad orogastric tube, which we use either 36 to 40 French uh, up to the his uh, angle. And then we connect the stomach with uh, small intestine, which we firstly measure of 150 centimeters uh, from trites ligament, and then uh, connect it is linear anastomosis. Uh, then we remove the orogastric tube and insert the nasogastric one across the anastomosis. Uh, and then we perform two layer closure with barbed stitch and we test the anastomosis. Uh, so small, some tips from my side, uh, we firstly check the small intestine. Where is there any problem? 
and measure the lengths of uh, BP limp, then fix to the greater uh, curvature so that we don't need to bother about it anymore. Uh, so if there are any adhesions or problems in the small intestine, we just switch for uh, sleeve gastrectomy. And uh, if when we do the stapled anastomosis, we need to make sure that these staple lines are not too close, close to each other to avoid ischemia. We then do anti-reflux stitch to avoid like falling of the ingested food into uh, the BP limb. Uh, is uh, sh uh, shown here, and we also fixed a front limb to the greater curvature to avoid twisting. This is the test of anastomosis, it's just a short video. Uh, the assistant and the surgeon closes the uh, BP limb and uh, the front limb, and then the anesthesiologist puts in the dye, as you can see here, as increased, increased um, intrauminal pressure and we can be sure that there is no uh, leak. We check from all sides and uh, are, have uh, good sleeps then, of course. We also can check with ICG, uh, but we cannot yet uh, tell you anything about the effectivity of this, but we have tried and we had only one leak as I will show you later. And uh, this is how we do. Uh, um, Y. This is uh, gastro jejunostomy. Uh, we just use coarse string suture along the anvil with this 25 millimeters circular stapler, and uh, then it is uh, all the the small intestine is again measured. It's uh, uh, 80 centimeters uh, mm, below right ligament, then we open it, we insert a circular stapling device, as you can see here, connect it together, and close the defect in the small intestine. And we believe um, that the circular anastomosis has better distribution of tension on the staplers uh, when compared to the linear one, because if we do the linear one, we think that the uh, most of the tension goes to the tip of the stapler line. Uh, and in the future, if we think about poach resizing, uh, the circular anastomosis is uh, or can be easily uh, transected this uh, with linear stapler, uh, but uh, in case there is linear anastomosis, there is already one uh, from the uh, pouch creation. The other one is from uh, the uh, anastomosis itself. And then we would add another one like third. And there is really, um, we believe there will be a high risk of ischemia in that region. And this is uh, enteroenterostomy as we do. Uh, we measure another uh, 70 centimeters from the efferent limb and then connect with a stapler and use, this is one layer absorbable barb stitch uh, closure and remove the, uh, remove the uh, small intestine. So uh, this is definitive closure of the, of the defect for the circular stapler. So our results, uh, we have a bias because of the COVID-19, but um, we have only now tw uh, about 20 OAGBs up to date, which average length of stay of 5.5. We had one anastomotic lead, but it was uh, not because of the stapling line. There was such a stitch canal around some holding stitch. We oversew it and then it was conservatively treated and we had one peptic ulcer in anastomosis. Uh, which was solved conservatively. Uh, our operating time is um, approximately two hours, but there is a little bias because we performed three times cholecystectomy and we only did five sleeves now. Uh, so the majority are bypasses and uh, also there is bias for the uh, cholecystectomy. And we have recently started with RU-NY, which 
uh, has very long operating time yet, but I, I believe it will get better. And as I said, uh, in my team, we did uh, about uh, 600 uh, sleeves in the past, but I did not include them in this uh, presentation. So this would conclude it. And thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kajek, for an excellent presentation. I have a couple of questions for you, you know. You yeah. talk about uh, anti-rotation plasty. So anti-rotation plasty means fixing the momentum to the stable line of yeah. the sleeve district, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And anti-reflux stitch, this is for one anosmosis gastric bypass where you, uh, you suture the apex of the small bowel to the lower part of the bowel, hopefully this will uh, divert a little bit the bile away from the bowel. Is this correct? Uh, no, uh, we believe it is, uh, it is just such a mechanical uh, theory, I would say. Uh, it uh, is not to avoid the bile from the pouch, but it's more uh, to avoid the food from uh, like entering the BP limb, I would say. All right. So how you how you handle uh, GERD after sleeve? You know, I'm do, we're doing uh, sleeve since two thousand and four, and we found that you know, I would say one third the patient after sleeve gastrectomy develop you know very uh, uh, resistant you know uh, GERD, and yeah. it's usually acid reflux, but sometimes even bile reflux. How how you handle that? You know, uh, we uh, always ask the patients whether do they suffer from uh, GERD or not. And if they do, we uh, like don't want to do sleeps in them. We, and as I mentioned, uh, we uh, indicate in everyone in our department, uh, mainly bypass, but we still cannot, uh, you know, uh, decide in forward which procedure you do it of course um, depends on your experience i would say but uh, as we started with bypasses uh, you can see that still we have about 80 to 85 percent of bypasses when compared to sleeves we only do sleeves when no other option is possible and uh, yeah, if if they have uh, if they have GERD afterwards, we uh, would uh, check them endoscopically and then may uh, switch for bypass after some uh, 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 some weight loss. Yeah, I think it should be feasible then. Great, because we found a good number of patients after sleep, the sleeve migrated up in the chest, and we uh, mm -hmm. we publish about this uh, phenomena, what's called sleeve migration. Sleeve can go up because the sleeve gets loose. So what I do now, uh, when I see hiatal hernia, patient going for sleep, I see hiatal hernia, fix a hiatal hernia, more posterior suture than anterior, and also I do couple couple of suture between the the muscle of the esophagus and right cross of diaphragm mm -hmm. and left cross of diaphragm. In addition, we put uh, we apply some form of glue to fix the sleeve uh, posterior. Mm -hmm. uh, one more thing about intraoperative hypotension. So. So we found one of the reasons for the people to bleed after surgery is uh, many of our patients under anesthesia, the anesthesia, anesthesia colleague beat, put the patient on the hypotension. So you're doing the surgery, blood pressure of 90, and we don't notice that, we focus on the surgery. After surgery, patient uh, uh, cough or vomit, blood pressure go up and they start to bleed. So I rather have them uh, during surgery to be on the high side, so I want them to bleed during surgery, not uh, not after uh, not after surgery. Yeah, I, I would have a short comment for this. Uh, it is for for um, from 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 our experience, we just do smoothly the surgery without extensive blood loss or bleeding uh, from the staple line, and then we let the anesthesiologist to increase the blood pressure, so we can see whether there is or is not any major uh, bleeding between the staple lines. And then we uh, put in the clips 
to stop the bleeding. So we leave the operating field without bleeding and we don't care much then about the blood pressure. But we, we think that uh, if there is a, a hypotension that the stapler like uh, squeezes more easily the tissue and uh, that not so much bleeding of course afterwards. That's great. One more point also you mentioned the ICG leak test. So I'm in love with ICG. I do ICG in all my patients now and we found ICG leak test first of all less expensive than methylene blue. Second, if you have leak just switching from ICG mode to regular mode, it doesn't stain the field. If you do methylene blue leak test and you have leak, the methylene blue can stain the tissue around and make it mm. challenging a little bit to discover the defect and the close defect. So yeah. we prefer now ICG leak test, but a great presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaja. Our last okay. presentation, Dr. Christian Roger, uh, uh, Rodgers uh, Lobas, uh, he is a bariatric surgeon in Mexico Bariatric Center. And, uh, and Dr. Lobas will uh, tell us about how I perform service. Hello, everyone. Dr. It's, it's Dr. Rodriguez. Rodriguez, I'm sorry. Pleasure to meet you, everyone. Let me share my presentation. So I wanted to share, how do I perform SADIS? Uh, can you see the presentation now? That's perfect like this. So I am from Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. It's near to San Diego, California. Uh, Tijuana right now is one of the cities uh, where I perform a lot of weight loss surgery, bariatric surgery, probably, uh, in a normal day, they can perform 250 to 300 surgeries per day. So um, in the company, the part that I do is high BMI patients and revisional surgery. Do the non-switch, it's a procedure that, that I like it so much. We offer this procedure to high, B, high BMI patient and revisional patients from a uh, gastric sleeve. So SADIS for me represent the evolution of the metabolic surgery. Uh, we, we still do classic uh, duodenal switch, uh, but in the last three years, we're doing more SADIS. Uh, I've been doing this from the last seven years. At the beginning, we did a lot of classical duodenal switch, but in the last three years, we're going, we're moving to SADIS procedure because we're having really good results. And for me, um, it represents the, the evolution of the, of the duodenal switch. Uh, we have uh, a lot of information. We have uh, a lot, other surgeons are doing this procedure. So uh, I like it so much. So uh, this is our experience. Uh, in total, we have 982 cases in the, in the last seven years. Uh, the SADIS procedures represent the 49% uh, percent of these cases. Uh, the 30% of our cases are conversion surgery, revisional surgery. So um, the, we are four doctors in the team, two surgeons, uh, Dr. Sandy and I, anesthesiologist, Dr. Escobosa, and our assistant, Dr. Veronica. So we only do laparoscopic uh, surgery. We don't have access to robotic. Okay, uh, our technique. I wanted to share to you our technique, how we do the SADIS procedure. So first of all, we need to do a perfect gastric sleeve. Uh, we like to use uh, a 40 French gastric calibration tube. Also, uh, we like to preserve a little more of antrum. Uh, we believe that uh, we if we remove all the antrum, we can have uh, dumping syndromes. So uh, we'll, we like to preserve a little bit of the antrum. 
Okay, we all we like to do mechanical anastomosis. Uh, I have tried uh, hand sewn anastomosis in in cases with the duodenum is really really uh, really really short. So if we do hand sewn, I can have a bigger anastomosis because if we do mechanical anastomosis, uh, probably is going to be shorter. So in some cases, I prefer to do uh, hand sewn anastomosis, but I try to do mechanical anastomosis, okay? So I want to show you the video. I did a video to share. Yes, yeah, great. We can see it now. Okay. So uh, the position of the patient. We use uh, American position. If I am the first surgeon, I'm going to be at the right of the patient. Let me go back again. I'm gonna be at the right of the patient. The second surgeon is gonna be at the left side of the patients and the assistant could be uh, at the feet of the patient, okay? So we start with this position. So the trocars. Trocars, trocars for me are really important. We, we need to place the trocar uh, and this is the way we do it. My right hand is gonna be the 12th millimeter stroker because I, I need to do stapling. My left hand is going to be a five millimeter stroker. The left hand of uh, the second surgeon is going to be a uh, 10 millimeter stroker for the camera. And the right hand of the, of the second surgeon is going to be a 12 millimeter stroker because he's going to do stapling too. And I like to use a liver retractor. So we use a five millimeter for the liver retract. So uh, we start with the, if I am the surgeon one, that is gonna be to the right side of the patient, we start a traditional gastric sleeve, uh, starting cutting the greater curvature. After we mobilize uh, that part of the stomach, the second surgeon is gonna do this section to the duodenum. The right hand of the second surgeon that is gonna be at the left side of the patient is gonna start because we believe it has a better position for dissection. So uh, we like to go really, really, really close to the stomach. We use ultrasonic scapel. The first surgeon is mobilizing the stomach and the omentum. And the second surgeon is, has the, in the left hand the camera and the, in the right side, the ultrasonic scapel. In our technique, the second surgeon works a lot. It's a dynamic uh, procedure. So uh, we cut the branches of the gastrointestinal artery. And at this part, we need to go really, really slow. At this point, we like to preserve the right gastric artery. And the first surgeon is going to cut the duodenum. We like to use a cure tip linear staple. And I believe uh, the best size for duodenum is from two millimeters to 2.5 and three millimeter staple. We, I like to reinforce the, the duodenum stump with the titanium clips. So we go to the, to the gastric sleeve. We don't like to put the, the tip of the bougie to the 
to the powders because we, we want to preserve a little part of the antrum. We need to do a perfect gastric sleeve, a really symmetric. Uh, the first surgeon is making the, the stapling and the first surgeon is the one that reinforced all the stapling line with running uh, interplectin 2-0 proline uh, suture. We reinforce the suture line in all our patients with not observable suture. So when we reinforce all the stepping line of the of our gastric sleeve. We can go to that duodenum. And do the do the anatomy. At the end of that duodenum, probably uh, we like to go more to the anterior wall. If we have three centimeters of duodenum, we are okay. Sometimes we can get five centimeters, sometimes two centimeters. So they go then. You go to cut the momentum. This is really important for us when high BMI patients. So in the next step, the first surgeon goes to the left side to the patient to go to the illusical valve and start counting. So the two surgeons are in the left side of the patient. We like to count for five centimeters to five centimeters. Our technique has been changed of the, uh, over the years because at the beginning, we start doing a lot of uh, classic duodenal switch. Uh, we did 2.5 meters uh, satis. Right now we're doing uh, three, three meters satis. Patients with BMI higher than 70, we can do 2.5 meters satis. So when we, we, when we do stapling, the second, the right hand of the second surgeon is the one who performs the, the, the stapling. This is the size of the stapler that we would like to, to use. Two millimeters, 2.5 millimeters and three millimeters. I really, really like to do mechanical anastomosis and to size anastomosis. Then with the observable suture, we do a continuous single layer full thickness uh, closure of the anastomosis. We like to take uh, the angles of the The first surgeon is the one who's performed the, the closure.
right now our times of uh, skin to skin procedure is about 80 to 90 minutes. It's really important for us to do full thickness uh, stitches because it's gonna be one layer. And right now we are promoting more one anastomosis do the switch than classical do the switch. Patients with acid reflux, we go more for a iron white gastric bypass. We believe that we need to go, we need to check the, we need to go for, we need to check the hiatus because sometimes endoscopy is not enough to, to confirm a hiatal hernia. So we like to go to laparoscopy, check the, the hiatus and we always fix it. At the beginning, we did um, we re we cut the right gastric artery, uh, just the first ten cases. But right now, we like to preserve the the right gastric artery. And we always do tension free stitch. That and it's only a simple stitch. We, we always do this stitch in RNY and into the on-switch patients. We don't do uh, one anastomosis gastric bypass. We like to do more RNY gastric bypass. Then we're gonna do a, a methylene blue leak test. Also with a little bit of air. Uh, single anastomosis do the not switch. Okay. okay. If you have some questions, feel free to ask Dr.
um, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, um, I'm wondering, uh, as, as I um, said, we always firstly check the small intestine and uh, check whole abdominal cavity for uh, adhesions or for any um, contraindication of such a complex procedure. So uh, right. you did not mention it, but do you perform any such tests? Because um, you never can be completely sure, in my point of view, that there is not some problem with the small intestine, some uh, uh, adhesions between loops or, or something like that. Do you routinely check it before you start with... Uh, yes, with yes, ADS? definitely. We, you, we must do that because uh, when we go to the illusical bulb, patients with pelvic uh, surgery, patients with a penisectomy surgery, you can find a lot of additions. Yes, you, you need to do that. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. I, I put the scope, I found the patient has uh, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, I mean, ending by switching during the sleeve, not by pass. You're going, uh, this is called incidentaloma. You're going for something, you found surprise that you may end it by changing your plan based on intraoperative finding. Old patient becoming like, you know, hypotensive and it's easy to have some difficulty. You may end up by aborting or changing your intraoperative uh, uh, procedures based on intraoperative finding. So we, we published uh, just a few minutes uh, having a, a question to everybody. We published the first uh, systematic review about SAD in 2017. And as we know that the uh, switch is the best of the best, but two concern that limit its uh, a spread, a widespread is uh, technical challenging. We'll talk about that today. And also the malabsorption. So let's talk about uh, these two things. So technical thing, we'll talk about the sleeve size and we're seeing more and more uh, tendency towards doing a, a smaller and smaller caliber sleeve going from, from 54 to 42. And now we'll talk about the 40 French uh, uh, tube. Uh, duodenal dissection, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we present, we, you guys show a great presentation for two techniques, is our uh, tunnel technique, and we'll talk about the tunnel technique, uh, uh, you need uh, great mobility, you need a small anvil, and these two criteria fit very well, the, the easy surgery medical uh, 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 light uh, stabler, and also we'll talk about the um, anastomosis, whether you do hand-sewing anastomosis or, or uh, GIE anastomosis. I would like to just ask a question, maybe we'll start with, uh, with uh, Dr. Ovidu. What happens if the bowel cannot reach up? So you're doing the setting, whether robotic or laparoscopic, and you dissect the, the, the duodenum, you transect the duodenum, and you're counting the bowel, and you count, you have all this wonderful counting mission, and you bring the loop up, the loop cannot reach. Now what? Yes, Dr. Saver, we actually encounter that phenomenon a lot in Virginia and in San Antonio. It's, and it's mostly common, mostly um, in males with large amounts of visceral fat and also with patients with a higher BMI, example, over 70 or 80. And so what we can do is a couple of things. If you choose to do the retroduodenal technique, which is really nice for preservation of the blood supply, then you can continue to mobilize the duodenal bulb a little bit towards the pylorus, but without having to devascularize the entire antrum. So you can continue to mobilize it towards the pylorus until it reaches a little more. You could also divide um, the greater momentum, like Dr. Rodriguez showed, which is excellent. So similar to what we do in an anticholic, antigastric bypass configuration. If that doesn't work, though, and that's exactly why I had that issue, I, you can always turn to the retrogastric dissection technique. So then mobilize the entire greater curve and you will see that it drops. And like I mentioned on my video and I showed, it almost becomes a midline structure. And yes, at the beginning, I was afraid of the blood supply, but look, like Dr. Rodriguez says, I, I, I share the same conclusion. If you preserve the right gastric artery, there will be blood supply to that area. And, as, and once you anastomose, the mesentery of the ileum will also provide 
the and the uh, the duodenal bowl with the blood supply that it needs. And so you can actually do the transgastric, the retrogastric dis dissection technique, and that takes care of the tension problem in most cases. Last case scenario. I had a couple of cases when my ex-partners and I actually had to turn to a classic BPD, not a, duo, not a duodenal switch, but classic BPD without duodenal switch. We ended up having to transect the, the distal port, the pylorus, and so anastomosing the ilium to the antrum itself. No more duodenal bulb, no more pylorus, and that is the definitive way to do it, and that takes care of the issue. All of this can be done without having to open the patient, in my experience. Great, thank you. Dr. Rodriguez, do you have anything to add? Yeah, you're doing a lot of study and uh, uh, one of the patients, as mentioned before, like central obesity or super, super obese, a lot of visceral fat and the uh, ileum cannot reach the duodenum. Now what? Yes, you can, you, you always must have plan B, plan B and plan C, okay? If you do a surgery, you can, you must have plan A, plan B and plan C. In those situations, you can cut the right artery. The duodenum is gonna be, uh, it's gonna go down. And you can always have a uh, gastric bypass, okay? And, key, and that could be a plan C. So um, there are some anatomic situations and, and you can always have a, gastric sleep like an option okay great Dr. what Sabre, about doctor yeah. i'm so sorry i forgot to mention one thing i did this in one occasion with my ex-partners actually you, the last thing you could do is do a right colonic medial lateral to medial mobilization just divide the white line of toll elevate the cecum and then it'll reach without any issue i mean that's the last case scenario of course it involves more work Okay, great, great idea. So basically, either you bring the duodenum down or you bring the bowel up. So let's have a similar question to Dr. Uh, Kajak. So you're doing gastric bypass and the bowel cannot reach the lower part of the pouch. Now what? With a single no. anastomosis or OI. So you did wonderful surgery and it's time for gastric genostomy and you, you try to bring the loop up and cannot reach. Now what? You know, we, uh, as I said, we always start by measuring the small intestine so and checking that it can reach. If it uh, doesn't, uh, we have a possibility to divide the uh, omentum uh, so that uh, to, to be able to do it antecolically. And of course, you can try to do it retrocolically or you can just switch to sleeve and uh, count on it that uh, the patient will lose some uh, body fat, which uh, decreases the, mm, the way needed to elevate the small intestine. So it's our strategy, but we of course don't have such big numbers. Uh, so we do it this way. Great. So what I usually do, I make a long narrow pouch. A long narrow pouch has the same volume of the short fat one. So then I will uh, split the momentum in all my cases. I bring the, the loop of, of bowel. I give a hundred centimeter biliobanchiatic lamp. I bring the loop bowel anti-colic anti -gas. If it cannot reach, I go more distal from leg trials. The more distal you are from leg trials, the longer the mesentery. It still cannot reach. I take the phrenoesophageal ligament. Phrenoesophageal ligament, when you take it, it drop you know, the pouch down. Like, uh, I had to say that. Like, if you open the belt of your pants, the pants will drop down. Same thing, all right? You still have tension, I go retrocolic retrogastric. So I'm doing bariatric surgery for 23 years. How many times I went to retrocolic retrogastric? Maybe one or two times. Mm. So all the time, if you have this algorithm in your head, very unlikely you're going to have difficulty from the bowel to reach up. So the other thing about controversy about the length of the bowel. So let's just go around and ask about what's your length of the efferent lamp or the common channel lamp, because this is linked to the diarrhea, number of bowel movement, and the malnutrition of vitamins, whether micronutrient or macronutrient uh, Malnutrition. So let's start with Dr. 
Oviedo? Yeah, so yeah. In San Antonio, when we were doing the, the Sadies at the beginning, we noticed that when they were 250 centimeter efferent channels, efferent limbs, we were having more issues with malabsorption and vitamin deficiencies, usually after the second year, usually two years later. Um, in, in fact, a couple of times we had to revise patients, two patients out of the hundreds that we did. We had to elongate the common channel. So we revised by making a bronze enteroenterostomy and we presented that at the American College of Surgeons. So to prevent that issue, we went to 300. And uh, once we started going to 300 centimeters, there were very few patients who had issues with malabsorption. So I think we have to tailor it to each patient. And of course, heavier patients, greater BMI, then you can always go shorter. But 300 is a good number for me. I'm very comfortable with that. Great. Dr. Rodriguez? Yes. Uh, that's why I said uh, SADIS is the evolution of the bariatric surgery. Right now, we know that 300 centimeters is a safety uh, land of the efferent limb. I know that Doodle Switch has uh, the history of the Doodle Switch with 50 centimeters, then 75 centimeters, 100 centimeters, 1.5 meters, um, a lot of malabsorption um, issues. But right now, at this moment, 300 centimeters, it's a safety uh land and with really really high bmi patients bmi higher than 70 uh 1.2 meters uh it's a it's like patient have symptoms but the overweight uh it, it's too high to and they need a uh, a less common channel great what about dr kajax how is your biliobanchiatic uh, limb length when you do gastric bypass with a one anastomosis row i what's your biliobanchiatic limb length uh in oagb we have one and a half meters and in uh, row y we use 80 and common channel is 70. so Great. together is again one and a half meters but we don't have that extreme obese patients. We uh, we um, are around 45, 40, up to 50, I would say. This one, uh, 68, was like rarity. Um, I, I, I believe they will come in the future, but now we have, um, for us, it's one and a half meters enough. Great. So the last point of our webinar today, I show something that's interesting about internal hernia space. Now, one of the advantages of going from a two anastomosis, a Ruai Dedina switch, or Ruai gastric bypass, to one anastomosis gastric bypass, or one anastomosis Dedina switch, sadly, is to have only one anastomosis and hopefully eliminate the uh, uh, intermesentric uh, defect if you go anticholic anticus. What about the Peterson space? Uh, let's go around it and you share with us uh, uh, your experience with uh, whether you close or not the Peterson space in one anastomosis sadi or one, uh, I mean, one anastomosis digina switch or one anastomosis gastric bypass. Let's start with Dr. Ovido, Houston. Excellent, excellent question, Dr. Saber. Of all the patients that we took care of uh, doing the SADI, one patient, and we never used to close that defect in the SADI. We thought that it was okay not to do it. One patient developed an internal hernia just behind the mesentery of the ilium, of the loop of ilium going to the duodenal ileostomy. Ever since then, and I had to revise that and take care of the patient. Uh, thankfully, no bowel was lost. But ever since then, I just closed that defect very easily. It takes 30 seconds and you're done. And so I haven't had any issues since then. How you close it? Uh, what suture and how you close it? I use a permanent suture. Usually I use two epibond, but you can also use proline. And I use a running suture from the from the area just inferior to the duodenal ileostomy down to, to uh, maybe five centimeters, seven centimeters. And I, I, it depends on the gap. It depends on the gap um, down to the, to the uh, greater omentum that attaches to the transverse colon. If you close that gap, it's very difficult for any loop of bowel to herniate. And it depends on the anatomy and the length. So you close the infracolic component of Peterson. As we know, Peterson space for the audience, uh, 
has a it's a space between the transverse mesocolon mesentery and uh, the row limb you know or efferent limb or the loop of small bowel mesentery and it has component below transverse colon and has component above more likely the bowel will be herniated for at the dependent part at the part below the transverse colon so this is the part that we're talking about whether you close or not I know that nobody closed the component above the transverse cord. So let, let's go to Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, how is your experience with internal hernia space closure with your sadness? Yes, we have three cases with uh, hernia. Uh, after those cases, if the tension between the mesentery of the small bubble is if, if you go to, to shake that Peterson area, to Peterson defect, you can see that the, the mesentery of the small bubble, the tension. If there is a lot of tension, we close it. If there's no tension, we leave it, we leave it there. We don't close the uh, Peterson space. But yes, we have uh, three cases of uh, hernia. Dr. Kajaks, do you close the internal hernia space with your anastomosis one and smooth gastric bypass? Uh, we uh, only close it or have closed in the Rouen Y. Uh, but uh, of course, as we have little numbers, uh, we don't had or uh, didn't have any hernia yet, but uh, I think it might change in the future. And as we have the first patient, I think we will close even in the OAGB. Great, we run out of time. I would like to thank the speaker very much for sharing their experience, tips and tricks for one and a bariatric surgery. I would like to thank uh, Easy Surgery Medical uh, for sponsor this event. So once again, thank you very much everybody and looking forward for more uh, uh, event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.